And I think we're live. Are we live? Looking, confirming, Janine Winters. Hi. Hi. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for Dr. having Dr. Janine me. Winters. Yes. Now, uh, you are a palliative care specialist. Yes. And you are, I was going to say, would you call yourself a campaigner, an uh, anti-euthanasia, or would you say you're just a... Uh, a doctor with an opinion. How would you classify your position on the euthanasia debate? Because you, yeah. you put a, the reason I found you was you put a submission in mm -hmm. um, that was not supporting the current euthanasia bill. That's correct. So how would you describe yourself in that area? I think that I'm a doctor with an opinion. Right. Um, so you're not affiliated with any group oh or anything no. like that. Yeah. So no. you just you have an opinion. No, I do have an opinion. You uh, had a busy day. You've been marking papers today. Yes, I have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's what, that time of year. What? Yeah, it is. So we're based in Dunedin, obviously, for people who are yep. watching us and don't know. Mm -hmm. What were you marking today? What was going on? Uh, medical student uh, papers mm -hmm. um, about their early professional experience. Um, mostly, it was about mind-body connection. Um, what does that mean? So that means that there were there were a couple of different questions about when people have illnesses that have an obvious relationship to stress and oh, to okay. other kinds of things that go on with the brain where the brain activates um, the the stress systems of the body. So, so the stress systems of the body uh, cause someone to be sick, or they enhance the sickness, or you know by enhance I mean make make bigger. Yes. Um, I would say probably both of those things right. that the the stress systems have um, effects. They have hormonal effects. They have neurologic effects, um, and they even have effects on things like the the length of the telomeres on your DNA. And that they've shown that stress hormones actually cause you to age faster. Oh, really? Um, yeah, the telomeres seem to determine how many times the cells are will replicate before yep. they stop. And so the stress hormones can even influence that. So the more stressed you are, the older you look. Some people, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. Wow, that's fascinating. And these yeah. students, are how far through their course? Um, we are grading for the year two and year three today. Right, and grade so grade year two and year three. This yep. is University of Otago, yes. obviously, mm -hmm. and that's year two. That's the first year of them being official medical students. Yes. They do a year of kind of sciences first. At yep. the end of that. Uh, all the top ones go on that want to go on to medicine or yes. the other ones do other areas within the mm -hmm. sciences, be it, you know, uh, do they do nursing? I was saying nursing, pharmacy, pharmacy dentistry. Physio, dentistry right. and lab sciences. I so believe. it's their second and third year of university, but first and second year of specialised. Yeah, it's the first year where they have the identity that they know that they're going to be doctors. Now, answer me this. How long does that take for a student to become a doctor? Is it Because uh, I've heard seven to ten years, including when they... You, you, they graduate and go out and do sort of three or four years of... Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's six years until you become a junior doctor. So you take six years to get your degree and graduate. Right. And, then and that includes that first year of sciences? Yes. So one year of sciences, five years of med, yes. and you're a junior doctor? Yes. Okay. And um, then they they practice and they're doctors, but they're under supervision from more senior doctors. Yep. And and they, they you have graduated levels of responsibility and... As you get those graduated levels, you teach the people below you right. and supervise them. Right. So there's a there's a saying: um, see one, do one, teach one. See one, do one, teach one. Yeah, cool. Yeah. I got that. Yeah. Well, if you can teach it, you know it. So that's a, it's actually helps people to become very highly competent in their in their field when right. they can explain, they can break down all of the steps that they need to do and explain it. Then they really know it. And your background, obviously, uh, there's an, a North American accent. Yes, Always is. careful not to say American if someone says, I'm Canadian, but it's from North America. That's yes. safe. We're about to yes. originating from. I'm from Cleveland, Ohio. Right. So my accent is um, the very the Great Lakes region. So right. it would be the same accent as Buffalo and Toronto. And how do you feel about LeBron going to the Lakers? <laughs> I don't care. You don't care? <laughs> <laughs> Just checking. Just checking. So how long have you been in New Zealand for? Um Almost five years. Yeah. I was here. It's been four and a half now, uh, and I was here a year in uh, two thousand five, two thousand six. And are you here for for the job? Are you here for university? Um, no, I'm here because I like New Zealand. Right. Okay. Yeah. So New Zealand first, job second. New Zealand first, right? I came. I came as a. I was a locum doctor in the Bay of Islands Hospital in Kawakawa. Yeah. And worked as a medical officer there for a year and fell in love with New Zealand and wanted to come back and so. It took a few years, um, got some kids to get through high school, and right. we got two of the kids through high school, and the third one is going through here in New Zealand. So three children, Yep. partner, Yep. so one child and partner with you in New Zealand. That's right. Other kids off, still, yep. still in the States? Yeah, well, they, um, they, 
they've sort of been here and sort of haven't. There's right. there's uh, one who graduated from the University of Otago here, um, and she's coming to visit uh, the day after tomorrow. Oh, nice. Yeah. Through the yeah. Christmas? Going to be here for Christmas? No, no, she's going to a wedding. Right. Um, but she's in school in the U.S. getting a master's degree, so... Oh, very good. Yeah, I'm and proud And your, your role within the university is one of a lecturer and a tutor? Yep, yep. Um, so, and uh, some research as well. Yeah. So, uh, but I came here because of, I came here to be a palliative care doctor. Okay. I was actually... So you didn't come to work at the, at university. the university? No. You came to work in the medical field? Yep. yep. Okay. I had been working at a university in the U.S. and it it um, felt like a bit much my... my dance card as they call it was overly full and it was felt stressful and right um and you don't want to be stressful because it ages you yeah yeah exactly <laughs> that's right and uh, i'd i'd love new zealand so much that uh we wanted to come back and we wanted to i i would have been very pleased if my children had all three of them stayed here but mm -hmm. One of them's going to be working as an aerospace engineer. Wow. So they don't have a big aerospace industry here in New Zealand. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the older two aren't going to come back, but our youngest one is here. Nice. So Very cool. Yeah, and you're, yeah. all, you're an All Blacks fan now? Yeah. Three yeah. and three? Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I don't have any other loyalties. Oh, good. I'm not a huge rugby person. You obviously but don't care about the, the Cavs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm more of an Indians person. The right. Cleveland Indians right. were, were our field. And all the way back, my father, my grandparents, we were all Indians fans. Yeah. Nice. Well, the reason I found you mm. was I um, actually saw an article in the ODT, if you want to bring that up, Jace. Um, and it was an article about people putting in submissions to the euthanasia bill. Mm -hmm. um, what caught my eye? Can you scroll that up a bit, Jace? A little bit, a little bit. I think it's about there, isn't it? This is you talking about here. I thought uh, you said that the, the current... Uh, legislative change technically the, mm -hmm. the what they're putting through is uh, terrible with quote terminal flaws I don't know if terminal flaws was a typically amazing yeah. one to use for uh, was I, it on well, purpose? I did that on purpose. Ah yeah. very good there yeah. and this is what you said as a doctor I would never want to participate in hastening death as one of the reasons I, I'm able to do the work that I do in palliative medicine which we've talked about it allows me to sleep at night that I allow a natural process to occur. Mm -hmm. Now, um, people who have seen our Facebook page might be aware that one of the reasons we haven't done a podcast in the last two or three weeks is we said there's been a family bereavement. Now, what actually happened is my mother passed away and she passed away of motor neuron disease. Mm -hmm. Uh, you can attest to the fact that me and you have been talking for maybe a month or six weeks <laughs> and it's coincidental that you're booked in now the week mm -hmm. after that happened but the idea of a natural passing versus euthanasia versus mm -hmm. uh, end of life decisions is incredibly uh, real to me right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. as this time two weeks ago I was probably sitting with my siblings and my father uh, beginning to plan a funeral you know, 10 hours after my mother mm -hmm. had passed. It's two mm -hmm. weeks today. Mm -hmm. So there may be some raw emotion in this conversation, mm. but that's mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. What I thought was I'd come away from that experience being incredibly um, clear on what I thought about euthanasia. I knew I was going to talk to you at some mm -hmm. stage because we've been, as I say, communicating for a couple mm -hmm. of months. Uh, and to be honest, I've come away with it from it kind of as confused as ever and mm -hmm. go, I don't know where I sit mm -hmm. on it at all. Mm -hmm. So um, we want to get into talking about this. I also want to know about uh, what bioethics is. Mm -hmm. You are a palliative care specialist. You are a bioethics specialist. Bioethicist. Bioethicist. <laughs> My ignorance when I read that article mm -hmm. was... Um, Perhaps one where I thought I would have thought in the medical fraternity that when someone was right at the end of their life, mm -hmm. that it would be ethical to, that the common belief would be it would be ethical to allow them to choose their path out. Mm. Now, obviously I'm wrong, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I'm right for some mm -hmm. ethicists and mm -hmm. wrong for yourself and other mm -hmm. ethicists. So that's sort of the, the genesis of this conversation, mm -hmm. what we want to talk about. Mm -hmm. So before we get into that, which I think for some people will be quite a heavy conversation, just mm -hmm. explain to me uh, bioethics, what it is and, and how it works with you, how you fit into that model. Yep. Um, so bioethics is looking at the choices that we have to make about, um, specifically I look at medical treatments, but it, it is broader. It's the whole field of, of biology, including animal welfare and other uh, uh, aspects. But I look at um, 
in, in medicine, we have a lot of dilemmas, oftentimes with competing interests and competing goods. So give me an example. Dilemmas such as? Um, one of the things I write about is if parents refuse a treatment for their child, where is the line between allowing them to have that latitude, yep. that it's their child and yep. their responsibility, and when does it go too far that it is endangering or going to kill the child um, to not have a treatment and that the state would take a role in ordering that treatment? So a couple of classic examples of that. On one end of the scale, you have certain religious groups not allowing blood to be in yes. introduced to them, so yep. they refuse help. What about on the other end of the scale, like people who choose not to vaccinate? Right. So so that seems, I mean, I we haven't talked about this, but that would seem to be a scale, yes. a pretty clear yes. scale. And and. In the thing I'm writing about is is that there are things that have very proven treatments that are short term and that we're pretty confident that the outcome is going to be a certain way, like giving blood after somebody's hemorrhage. And then there are treatments like for cancers and for very complicated things, liver transplants or, or certain kinds of cardiac surgeries for babies that can go well or not go well. Mm. And where is the line in allowing a, a parent to say, you know, that, that route isn't for me and my child. I, yeah, it's interesting. I, I The idea, I, I mean, I don't know what the, what the official doctor's line is, but mm. there's always said the idea of do no harm. Mm -hmm. So if you've got a child in front of you that is going to be harmed by their children, uh, by their parents' decision, what does one do? And I guess that's, that's the, right. that's the, the by, that's by and what is right and yeah. what's the amount of harm and to whom and is and there I, I, harm even though a doctor shall do no harm is it okay that the parents can if they want right well that's and how much harm so I, so I, when so when you're talking to your students at otago university mm. i just feel like that what we've just nutshelled in 30 seconds sounds like a four-hour lecture and a three thousand word essay afterwards yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so it's so that's an example of mm. the, of that. What else? What are, what else are we looking at with bioethics? Oh, it can be it can be anything. Like I said, well, what's uh, your area of speciality? So, yeah, I have two areas. So my areas are pediatrics and decision making for children, which is why I um, brought up that example. Mm -hmm. And before I came to Dunedin, one of my stressors was that I was the director of a pediatric palliative care program. Wow! So I was dealing with making. Uh, decisions with families and with other doctors about how much is too much and how much do we, should we do and when is it to the child rather than for the child and right. how to give this child a, the the best experience under the worst circumstances. That's a really interesting way of saying it when you're doing it to the child mm. rather than for the mm. child. So at some yeah. stage, end of life care mm -hmm. is something you're not doing for them mm -hmm. but to them. Can be. Wow, as a Can parent, mm -hmm. that's really heavy. I mean, as yeah. a human being, that's heavy. As yeah. I said two weeks ago, we were not quite going through this, but yeah. but as a parent, thinking about that for a child is really yeah. heavy. It's a terrible dilemma because yeah. as parents, we are supposed to advocate for our children and and want to push the system to provide everything that we want for our for our child, but there comes a point where we aren't doing as good anymore that the mm. interventions. Um, become more and more uh, invasive or difficult and less and less help for a child. And so there there comes a time when it's time to switch. We call it switch goals. And that the when the goal can't be cure anymore, the goal is to optimize that child's life and make it as best they can for the time that they have. Okay. So one area is uh, palliative care with children. Yep. What else? What's the other area? Um, so pediatrics and end of life are my two big issues, okay. um, are the, the topics that I study. I also am interested in the clinical ethics committees, which is the process when people have a dilemma and they don't know what to do, where they have a resource within their hospital or community mm -hmm. to bring it to a group of of um, clinicians, family members, sometimes clergy members, um, and and people who will uh, look at, to try and, and pick apart what the issues are. And, and one of the things is identifying the dilemma. Usually there is a competing goods, mm. and to identify what the competing goods are. And sometimes we can come up with a finesse where um, both sides are, are happy by a, a solution that nobody had thought of mm -hmm. and other times it um you're really in the weeds with um nobody's happy you know with 
with uh, um, uh, you know a, a problem that there's just no answer to. So when you say nobody's happy, are you talking about the family, the patient, and the doctors, or is the family and the patient kind of one area, doctors other area? You know, I'd say that nobody is happy when there is some sort of a compelled uh, treatment when the when the two when two parties like say that the the even if it's different family members or if it's the family and the medical team mm-hmm. when when their irrep- when their relationship has been severed and that there's no longer trust and that they are angry you know really everybody loses yeah honestly no matter what's decided because i think that there's a lot of parts of medicine that are about trust and about um, compassion and about walking in somebody else's shoes and so if we get to the point where they they can't have that with each other then um, it's a it's a big loss for the all of the decision making processes and all of the um, the things that that make a medical relationship healing Mm. which you know it isn't just the medicines that we provide I really do believe that it's You know, when I look you in the eye and I say, you know what, I really think that you're going to feel better in a few days. Yeah. There is something really important in that, that that's hard for the the bean counters to measure. Yeah, absolutely. But it's it's still part of that calling of of medicine. Mm. Yeah. And look, I apologize for just taking my hoodie off in the middle of that conversation. I was with you the whole time. Yeah. Just getting a bit warm. Um, It's interesting. uh, Talk about sort of the no winners. Uh, with what happened to my mum, I was talking to one of my daughters and I was in Auckland Mm -hmm. and they were in Dunedin, so it was over the phone. And I was like, you know, you can have any feeling you want. Any feeling Mm -hmm. is valid. Mm -hmm. I said, you can be, you know, Gran Gran had motor neuron disease. You can be happy that she's released from that, that Mm -hmm. she's gone. Mm -hmm. You can be sad because you've lost her. You can be angry, X, Y, Z. And she went, why would I be angry? And I said, because it's not freaking fair. Mm -hmm. You know, it's yep. like actually this woman who was an amazing woman, a great wife, a great mother, had lots of grandchildren, healthy as an ox, never on any kind of warfarin or any kind of drug at all. Mm-hmm. You know, in one of the ends, um, her heart and lungs were so healthy that was one of the things that continued her on mm-hmm. beyond uh, what the doctors didn't think she would. And I'm saying, mm-hmm. you're allowed to be angry. It mm-hmm. fucking sucks. This yeah. sucks so yep. badly. Yep. So it was like kind of teaching the kids that anger is valid you'll have all those emotions yeah. and all of them together yeah, yeah. totally mm-hmm. so um i'm really interested to talk to you about this yep um i w- the idea of euthanasia is not legal in new zealand mm-hmm. i was wondering though are there technicalities we hear stories and this mm-hmm. might be interesting for you to either confirm or not we hear stories about people right at the end of their life being given morphine, quite a lot of it. So they're basically not there, mm-hmm. being put to sleep, just waiting for death. Is that a form of euthanasia? Or is that like euthanasia light? Um, does it actually happen? Or is this just one of those urban myths that people say happens and doesn't really in, in the hospitals? So in, in palliative medicine, we make um, some some distinctions that... I think are really important, and I think that they're they're really important for those of us practicing palliative medicine, mm-hmm. um, because it it there's a line drawn, and and that line is is that it's never our intention to hasten death. So there are things that we do in the course of end of life care that has the possibility of shortening life, mm-hmm. but our goal is to have people not have suffering for them to be comfortable, yep. and that. You know, with every this is true for every medication. For every medication, there's the potential of side effects and things that you don't want to happen. You know, for everything from anesthesia to warfarin. You know, um, and so these are the potential side effects. Mm-hmm. Most of the time, it, it's pretty rare to sedate somebody to the point where they're completely out of it. Right. Um, we 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 have a procedure called palliative sedation, which is extremely rare in my practice about twice a year um, in all of the settings that I've practiced in and I've been doing this for about 20 years in three major settings now in two countries Mm -hmm. so um, about twice a year we have to take somebody to the level of uh, unconscious 
to control their suffering. Um, most often that's physical pain, mm -hmm. but occasionally it's some sort of an emotional pain or... Mental anguish. Yeah, mental yeah. anguish and, and fear yeah. um, and so on. But most of the time we do give morphine. Morphine, um, we our motto is to start low and titrate to effect. Right. So we give probably um, about one fortieth of what a lethal dose of morphine would be. And that would right. be the starting dose of... So it sounds like what you're saying, though, is when you're talking about hastening death, mm. hastening the end of life, that if some of the m medicine, or some of what you're applying does do that, mm -hmm. that's a byproduct of what you're doing to right. make someone more comfortable right. rather than the target to right. do it. Yes. That's what you're saying? Yes. Right. They so if that morphine or the whatever... Yep brings the end of life closer yeah it's that's not the reason for doing it the right. reason is to be comfortable and to be whatever other words right. work in there and yes it may do that but that's not what we're trying to do yes right gotcha and and what i think about it and what most i think palliative care uh specialists think is is that in our routine practice mm -hmm. of giving morphine that we're using very very safe levels that aren't hastening death and some people worry a lot about these little doses of morphine hastening death. And the literature in, in our field in palliative medicine for the last 20 years shows that morphine in, our, in the doses that, that we use don't, does not hasten death. It's very clear literature. Right. It just hasn't gotten to the public knowledge yet. So the things so, that... So what you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying is it's a bit of an urban myth. It is a that, bit of an urban myth. That doctors will fill you full of morphine and help, yep. you, help you die. Yep. yep doesn't happen at all or, or it's not best practice or if it did happen there'd be a court case you're hmm, <laughs> that's a lot of that's multiple choice it is um, a b or c or so other. so the first thing does it happen i've never seen it happen okay. where i thought that somebody was given a lethal dose of medication on purpose right um is it possible that it's happened in places where I haven't been? Absolutely, it's possible. People are, are people all over the place, and so yeah, sure. different things that are out of the norm happen. Um, it's it's not the the usual practice to sedate somebody to the point where they're unconscious. Right. You know, unconsciousness can come in the process of dying, um, but the doses of morphine that we're using, they may make somebody a little lethargic, a little loopy, um, but not unconscious. It's usually the disease that makes them unconscious. And again, if it did lead to um, you know, unconsciousness, it would be the byproduct, not the yes, not the not actual the target. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a name for this. It's called the principle of double effect. Right. Um, and it goes back um, uh, to Thomas Aquinas, and it goes back even further than that. You can trace it to the Greeks, to Aristotle. But the what the principle of double effect is is that if you have something that's good that you're intending but that there would be something that would bad that would happen that's not the intention, mm. but that that is allowable to achieve the good thing. That's in the law as well, outside medicine. Yeah, it, yeah. It's like, it's like I mean, the classic example is always, uh, I, can break an I can break the law by breaking and entering into your house if your house is on fire to save you. So technically I'm committing a crime kicking your door down, but if it's to save yeah. you, it's the it's it's allowable. Yeah. yeah. And then theology and, and Catholic theology where Thomas Aquinas was working, it was about war and and other kinds of things like that 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 you do bad things in order to get a good objective. Mm. Um, but fortunately like I was saying, um, we think that in palliative medicine that we use the principle of double effect very rarely that the the normal doses of of morphine, it is an urban myth that they that they are what is causing people to decline. All right. Yeah. Your um, position on euthanasia, the current mm. euthanasia um, bill mm. uh, before the House or still in subcommittee, whichever yeah. wherever yeah. it exactly is, uh, the David Seymour bill, we'll call it for want of a mm -hmm. better term. Um, do you put yourself in the position that you are against euthanasia? End of conversation, or is there something specifically in this bill? for your reason for a submission against it yep so there's there's two points in there one is is that um i think i i feel i have a different opinion about it as a consumer yep. versus as a doctor right so as a consumer i had a grandmother who died of end-stage dementia mm -hmm. and i can totally understand wanting to have that control to have um you know, some some way that you can take control of a situation where you're really worried that you're having a lot of, of suffering and and not have that go on. Mm -hmm. 
as a doctor, I am not keen to be the person that's responsible for ending somebody's life. That's a huge responsibility. And what if we're wrong? What if, what if I've seen people who've had the diagnosis wrong or we thought was going to live a few months where they've lived a lot longer. Right. And then I'm the person that's responsible for having taken away those, that potential. And I know that the person who asked for it, that they have some, some choice in the matter too, but they're working with information that, that they were given that might be wrong. And they're in a very fragile state. Mm -hmm. when, when you've had bad news, you are not in your best position for making you know, your best decisions. Right. And not that some people can't, but there will be lots of people very vulnerable at that point in time. So I think that there is responsibility on the doctor, that it is not just the, the patient um, you know, an autonomy that, so one of the, I'll, I'll go back, one of the things in bioethics is, is that we, we work in, in medicine on, on that there are four principles mm -hmm. that um, make up one of the, the biggest streams in, in what we use in bioethics. It gets more complicated after that, but the four streams are that autonomy, that the patient um, gets to uh, have a huge say in what happens to their own body. Right. The second one is beneficence, that we should do good. Mm -hmm. The third is called non-maleficence, but it's what you said earlier, which is do no harm. Right. And then the third is a principle of distributive justice, which means that um, if if I'm getting a certain medical care and I'm taking something away from you, mm -hmm. that we need to look at fairness in that. So especially in New Zealand, where we come out of one you know giant pot of money, um, how to spend that fairly and do it right. So right. those are the four things in 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 bioethics. And I think that it's relevant in the topic of uh, euthanasia because it isn't just autonomy. When, when people want to um, legalize euthanasia, the, the argument is usually it's my body, mm -hmm. my life, mm -hmm. my death, and I get to decide how that looks. And while that is one of the values, there is another side, and the, the doctor's side is, is that you're, you're putting a huge burden onto those doctors that do you have the diagnosis right? Can the person, are they in a vulnerable state? Are they um, depressed or have another reason why they don't have capacity to make that decision right now? Are they being coerced in a way, in any kind of a way? If And there's subtle coercion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's the coercion of I don't want to be a burden to my family. Yep. Um, but there's, al there's also, if we're being disgustingly revolting, there's, oh, I want my inheritance. Right. They can go there as well. Right. And and even that the, the parents want them to have their inheritance. Right. You know, why should I spend all the money that I spent all these years earning to go towards the, my rest home care? Yeah, my $3,000 a day, you know, uh, care in the hospital, whereas that could be in my grandchild's pocket. Right. So it's basically, right. that, so that's interesting because that sounds like suicide. Yeah. Rather than euthanasia. So what, what, where, what's the line? Like, That's right. Like this is one of the questions I've always asked. I've, I've worked as a talkback host for 10 years on News Talk ZB and one of the questions when this topic came up, which wasn't irregular, mm -hmm. so I guess that means it was fairly regular, was if someone wants to kill themselves, mm. they can. Mm -hmm. It's called suicide. Yep. Um, isn't it better for those people to be able to do it in a space where they've got friends and family around them, they go as they want, et cetera, et cetera. Now, I'm not saying that's my yeah. belief, but that's one of the common right. situations. You know, do they want to, oh, I don't want to be graphic, well, but swallow a shotgun, or do they want to have all of their families around them on their right. last night? Well, and that's that's the part of it where, as a consumer, that I think that I feel like I understand and, and, and um, could feel like I would want something like that. Mm. Um, but I also know that that's the rosy glow kind of a view. Sure. You know, in one, so to answer the rest of your question about the Seymour bill, there's a few things in there that I really dislike um, that I think, I think it's a poorly written bill. And having um, written some legislation way back in high school yeah. and in and other um, uh, non-legal uh, groups um, for, you know, like writing bylaws for an organization. Mm -hmm. I've had some experience doing that. And I think it contradicts itself, and I think it's got some really big problems. One of the problems is is that there is no requirement to involve the family. So right. that this could occur... So grandma could just say, take me, 
and, right. and and kids could be like hang on grandkids want to say it doesn't right. matter well and it doesn't even have to be grandma that, i mean I, yeah that picture it somebody who's in their 30s that doesn't make sense to me um in new zealand we have it's actually uh, this okay personal story maybe it's ironic how much for example the maori culture floods in through mm. new zealand so one of my specialist times last week two weeks mm -hmm. ago when my mother passed away mm -hmm. there was something deep 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 inside me that refused to leave her body i wasn't i, mm -hmm. I couldn't leave her body it wasn't like i i had to and it was an emotional thing necessarily but i felt wrong leaving her body in mm -hmm. the room and i knew i had to stay with that now i've got no maori in me at all i'm basically 99 percent irish um but i would joke it's the maori in me you know it's mm -hmm. this thing that you stay with the body and you and you keep with the body mm -hmm. and one of my um my and my best memories of that time was 90 minutes after the rest of my family had left on the thursday between about 10 a.m and 11 30 waiting for the undertaker just me and my mum being in the room she'd passed i was sitting in the lazy boy that my sister had slept in overnight cap down over my eyes having having a bit of a sleep Mm -hmm. So the idea of excluding the family mm -hmm. feels very selfish mm -hmm. to me right at this moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean, this is probably too much to ring, but you know, this is that's my mum's wedding ring mm. and my mum's eternity ring, mm -hmm. and it's with me always at the moment. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I basically can't take it off. Mm -hmm. So, so this idea of having the right to exclude the family on such a big thing mm -hmm. doesn't feel right to me. Either. Right. And it's, it's a recipe for complicate, what we call complicated grief. Complicated mm. grief is, is it's normal to go through bereavement when somebody dies. And that's a, you know, it's a difficult thing. We were talking earlier about all the emotions that, that, that you feel. Um, but there's sometimes comes where people can't get over that and mm. that they have a feeling when it goes into depression, a feeling of personal worthlessness and, and, um, you know, it just gets way out of, of control and um, those kinds of things tend to happen when it's it's a situation where they didn't feel like they had a lot of control to be to right. begin with so um, it tends to happen when people are young it tends to happen um, in you know the the tragic circumstances in families that um, where you have these m conflicting feelings about um, the person who died for mm. example I mean if they were um, abusive or something else like that you know there's this both a sense of relief that they're gone and then that sense of guilt like how can I be relieved yeah you know and those those situations um, go really deep mm. so when somebody um, isn't involved in the choice of euthanasia and all of a sudden they find out after the fact that somebody really important to them has um, taken their their life has hastened their death mm -hmm. um, it can be, I think that the people will search for reasons, you know, why did they do this? How did they do this? And it have a lot of the feelings about when somebody has a suicide. Um, I had a friend who, who was, who suicided and she was 25 and I hadn't seen her for two years, but I, you know, you go, what could I have done? And what, mm. you know, there's something very different about a death that is, is suicide. Um, and, and what you ask yourself um, w how could this have been different? And I think for family not involved with a euthanasia decision that it would be, that those kinds of feelings would be. So again, this is in David Seymour's bill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That basically he's saying the person who is passing mm -hmm. has complete autonomy in the decision, mm -hmm. irrelevant to what anyone else in their family wants. Right. That sounds like there's a part of the bill that you're really against. Mm -hmm. The question before, I was going to say for people who are just joining us, it's a podcast, you've heard the whole thing, um, <laughs> was is it is it the euthanasia thing you're against or is it the bill or both? And so there's part of the bill you're very anti. Is it What, what else in the bill do yeah. you say? You've said poorly written. You've said yep. it contradicts itself. Yep. You've said, um, you know, being able to exclude the family. Yep. Sounds like you hate it all. At the yeah, moment. <laughs> well, the safeguards, I don't think the safeguards are adequate. So explain the safeguards. Okay, so the, the two of the main safeguards are that I, I've mentioned two things, that person has the capacity to make the decision. Meaning they have their full faculties? Yeah, their yep. full faculties and that they are um, not have depression or other right. kind of... Uh, uh, a mental illness and they don't have anything like uh, um, dementia or things that that make them not 
um, clear in, in their loyal to their normal personality, if you will. Yep. Um, so there's, there's capacity and then there is coercion. And in, the, in this bill, there is only one person who decides both things, and it's a doctor. And doctors aren't trained, for example, to decide coercion. I wouldn't, you know, you could ask, I could ask you, you know, are you being coerced? But how do you actually get to those deeper kinds of, of um, situations that we talked about where maybe one of the issues is money and that the person wants to die because they would rather their grandchild have sure. the money instead of themselves? And or the, or the medical fraternity have it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's not a coercion like you're gonna do this or else and I'm gonna, you know, put your arm in a yeah. in a hold and make you take this pill. It is the the sort of the guilt and the um, you know, the the other kinds of nonverbal things that uh, vulnerable people uh, can can have. And and people who are used to actually they find that the people who want euthanasia, this is um, from the studies in Oregon actually tend to pe be people who are used to a great degree of personal control. Oh, really? Yeah, and are used to a lot of um, having a lot of choices. So when I say vulnerable, I don't mean vulnerable in the sense of the uh, traditional societal classes classification of vulnerable based on um, income and race and, and poverty and education. It actually tends to be people who are highly educated, who are used to having a lot of control, but even those people become vulnerable when we become ill. You know, I'm one of those people. I'm a very forward thinker. And um, and the idea of being extremely vulnerable mm. isn't very appealing. Mm. You know, so I can I can sure understand having some choices. You know, that's why I say as a consumer. So how do I put, uh, and I'm going to answer this question before you ask it. How do I put these two <laughs> sides of me together? Sure. Um, I am... More, much more comfortable with the, the Oregon model that I mentioned before, which is an assisted suicide model, where the doctor, although they do a, they're still involved with a screening, whether the person has capacity and whether they're coerced and whether they have a terminal illness. Um, but that the person then goes to, they write a, they, then they stop at writing a prescription and then the doctor's part is over mm -hmm. and the person goes to a pharmacy, fills that script and then they can decide whether or not to take the medication and they can do it at their own time. Wow. And what they find is a significant percentage of the people never take it. Um, I think it's somewhere between around a quarter or a third, something like that, that uh, in fact, you might look that up. Um, so what are we looking at, the Oregon? The Oregon, yeah. Oregon has really good statistics about the, um, they've had one of the first assisted suicide programs so this is, let me just backtrack a little mm. bit. Um, what we hear about in the media quite a lot is people like Dr. Death, Dr. Kovorkian, and yep. his uh, assisted suicide machine, machine, which has got three needles, he walks away, the person then injects themselves with a, a, a pain, a sleeping, and then the thing. Mm -hmm. When they go and get their um, medication in Oregon, is it pill form? Are yeah, they it's a pill. So it's like a suicide pill? Yeah, it's a suicide pill. Wow. It's something, it's uh, a barbiturate is, is the name of the... I can't see uh, the prescription recipients and death. recent deaths. Yeah, right how about yeah. the number of people who've uh, filled the prescription? Because they have they have yeah. the statistics of the number of people who have asked. Yeah, the number of people who have gone through the screening process and have gotten uh, approved that they can yeah. do this. The number of people who picked up their pill from the pharmacy. Yeah, and then the number of people who have taken it. So, Jace, why don't you Google something like uh, how many people in Oregon who get a suicide pill mm. then take it? Yeah, yeah. Well, this graph that I've just got here yep. that you can see on the screen. I'm yep. just going to bring it up for everybody at home to see this one here. I think if I'm reading it right, basically this is just a basic death. Uh, oh yeah, number yeah, of there prescriptions you are. Oh, so the, okay. Death. So if I'm reading it right, it's just below 150 people actually take the pill, and about 200, just over 200, actually get the results. So, it's so at the it's highest peak, it's looking 70%. like t yeah, 200 people versus just under 150. So yeah. that's yeah, you know, that's so about what, a quarter don't take it. Yeah, so two thirds maybe take yeah. it. Yeah, and see, that's where I mean, this is where I can see myself. I think. I would be a person who would like to have that pill if I were in a terrible situation, right. but that I probably wouldn't take it. Right. But I would like that comfort of of having it. So this is why I'm on the 
I'm actually not a a uh, a person uh, who is. I don't consider myself any kind of an advocate or as a uh, a person with a black and white thinking about this. Right. I, I consider myself really smack dab in the middle. The funny thing about that, though, mm. m- maybe as I've seen too many movies, mm. <laughs> but I think that feels really much more dangerous mm. than in a hospital in a controlled situation because I think straight away if I've got a suicide pill, you know, I mean, what if it's given to someone else? Right. What if it's used for nefarious reasons? That's We're in a too. hospital that's a controlled situ- or you know, a, a end of life facility Mm -hmm. it's a controlled situation and Mm -hmm. but it sounds like what you're also saying is you're not necessarily completely anti the idea of aiding someone to terminate you're anti mostly this bill and all the flaws in it yeah i'm mostly i'm mostly the bill and the flaws and i have a lot of problems as a that doctors are intimately involved that the the amount of responsibility that that puts on the doctor to be in 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 this process. So a doctor who's trained, as we said earlier, for six years and then another three or four years, and they've then had a practice for twenty years, helping people, keeping them well, keeping them alive. Now you're asking them to basically kill someone. Yeah. And so that, that so that's a problem. But then also, I would think that giving someone a suicide pill and walking out of a chemist, who then could use it in any way, any shape, yep. anyhow, also seems like a yep. problem. It does. It does. And I mean, you, that would I be an interesting step. Do people use the suicide pill on other people? Yeah. Well, I don't know if they, they'd ever find that out, no, but it's, of course it's possible. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the one of the important things you've said about this issue is, is that the more you learn about it and the more you think about it, the more complicated it gets. Totally. And we, as doctors, and a, I have a friend who's an oncologist, and, and he calls it the barbecue conversation, that, that somebody will approach him about, well, what do you think about this euthanasia thing? Mm. And as he starts explaining some of the real scenarios of somebody who has you know, an 80% chance of this happening and a 20% chance of that happening, and you know, there's not a lot of certainty, mm. um, and that lots of things could happen anyways. And, and as he... The more he starts getting into this with the person in their barbecue conversation, the more the one goes, oh, that's really complicated. Yeah. <laughs> I've never thought about that. Who would figure? Yeah. And and that... Uh, it's like our friend Donald Trump when he's saying he could uh, solve the issues of the healthcare system. Right. And then one of his first press conferences after he was elected, he literally said, who knew this was so complicated? And it's yeah. like everybody knew it yes. was so complicated. Yes. And I think that that's the, the case with with euthanasia so i i consider myself a moderate on the topic because Mm. i am open i am not i I call it somebody who is um there are people who are very much opposed to it based on an argument about sanctity of life and based on yeah let me ask you something mm. on that because a lot of people who seem to be uh anti-euthanasia for want Mm -hmm. of a better word have a religious aspect to them Mm -hmm. that seems to be very very prevalent is that any part of your belief process is there any part of your position um mostly not but mostly a little not. bit so there's a little bit so there is a little bit there is a little hesitation of what if what if i'm wrong you know i'm wrong, I am, you mean wrong about the person being terminal no well yeah about that too but also what if i'm wrong about um how to that that being involved i i'm not uh I don't subscribe to any particular religion. Sure. Um, but I certainly was brought up with one religion. Which and one were you brought up with? Well, actually, I was brought up with two. I was brought up with Catholicism mm-hmm. and Unitarian Universalism, mm. which are two very different things. Universalism more, uh, everything's okay, everything's good. Yeah, Everyone gets to the much. same end. Yeah. Catholicism more, uh, the more guilty you feel, the closer you are to God. Oh, you're up Catholic as well, so I'm allowed yeah, to say that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I was brought up with two different ways. But... Um, so mostly mine is not based on religion. I don't argue about this this topic on the sanctity of life issue because I believe that that is an issue that either, for most people, yeah. either it's a really important part of your personal philosophy mm-hmm. or it's not. Um, and so that it, it's not, there's not a lot of uh, room for discussion around the idea of of what does sanctity of life mean, you know, and what, what decisions fall out of that. So I'm, I'm looking at much more from a pragmatist point of view. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that has been said is that the people who argue um, 
for euthanasia are very much focused on autonomy mm -hmm. and a lot of the autonomy doc meaning the the patient having complete control right. of whatever they want that's right gotcha and the a lot of the hesitance there's actually a lot more hesitance on the part of the medical profession particularly palliative care doctors but so again meaning they are hesitant and wanting to hasten death yeah as opposed to and to legalize put putting in place good solid care for the end of life right and gotcha. to legalize it yeah that um they tend to focus on all the things that can go wrong mm -hmm. Um, like your your example of if you have a suicide pill and it goes home with somebody, does it actually go into the that person terrifies me. that it was Honestly, intended for? Yeah, wow. But there are so Kid, the kids find it in the cupboard. The yep. water. Oh yep. man. Yep. 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 Yeah. Um, but there are so many different um, uh, variations on that theme of all the things that can go wrong. Yeah. And the the thing that worries me. It's like the capital punishment. Mm -hmm. You know, my dad was an attorney and he um, always told me that he was very, he was against capital punishment because too many things can go wrong sure. in the in the process of taking somebody through the court process. And once somebody's dead, there no is coming no back. coming back from that. And if you have a look at this day and age, the number of people who've been released from death row That's based right. on things like DNA evidence. Yes. Completely correct. Right. Yeah. And I think that the same thing is true for euthanasia right. is that there are so many things that can go wrong. Everything from um, not having actually having a terminal illness um, to having a severe depression to the number of people we know that, that changed their mind. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the idea of having an appointment for death, that a, if people are given the pill, and we know that a lot of them, a quarter of them say changed their mind, mm -hmm. um, if they have an appointment and they have a doctor showing up, which is the Seymour bill has that you, you set a time, the doctor has to, to come and stay until death occurs. So once you've like made you know, have an appointment, mm. people feel like, I think that they would feel, I always feel like I need to keep my appointment. If <laughs> I miss an appointment with, with somebody who's expecting me, I feel badly. Yeah. So even, isn't that in a sense a coercion if they're, if they're a having last of minute, polite missile, politeness yeah, a almost. coercion of politeness that they, they have these last minute thoughts about. So Jace has just brought up, is it Washington Post? All the Trump supporters will be saying, fake news. Um, yeah, 20 Washington Post. 20%, 20 of patients with serious conditions are first misdiagnosed, study says. This is, this is for patients who go and get a second opinion. Yeah. Right. Well, this, I know from, so I, I work in, I worked in hospice in the U.S. as I, as I also work in, you know, hospice and palliative medicine here. Mm -hmm. And we see people on our program who are, who well outlive that their their diagnosis, and it doesn't mean that they don't have a serious illness. What it means is is that we really don't have a clue when people are in their last six months of life. We all right, we have a clue, but there are a significant number of outliers. So what about if if um, and I know using anecdotal examples is mm. not fair, okay, but I will. Okay, <laughs> I've been involved in two uh, elderly people passing away in hospital. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first was a gentleman who got told this was his last night on the planet by the doctors. Mm -hmm. They said, mm -hmm. this is your last night. Mm -hmm. um, and then there was my mother a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And I hear what you're saying about misdiagnosis or we don't really know they could live for another six months. In those situations, it seems to be correct and inevitable. No one would expect mum mm -hmm. who had motor neuron disease who was in an electric wheelchair whose body was failing mm -hmm. to go for another four, five, six months. Yep. I, when I said at the start of this, I can see both sides. I'll, I'll explain an example why. I have no doubt in my mind that there would have been times leading up to her passing that my mum would have said either to herself or maybe confided in someone I don't know that if she could end it today, she would. Mm -hmm. I have no doubt of that. Mm -hmm. I also know from the time she went to hospital uh, to the time she passed was the most amazing time for me. I don't want to speak for my siblings. I don't want them to hear this and go, oh, so you enjoyed watching it. It wasn't that, but there was a family bonding. And I think mum finally came to terms with her, her, her mm -hmm. diagnosis, which she hadn't, I don't think she had done. Mm -hmm. There was a real healing. There was mm -hmm. a real, and like I said before, my time after she passed, which if she had have taken one of those moments to go, I could go today, no, we wouldn't have got. And there would mm -hmm. have been, 
as you said before, that kind of questions, what could we have done? That sudden ending. But equally, I think, for example, Wednesday night she went to sleep. Mm -hmm. She didn't wake up again. We knew she wasn't going to wake up again. It was just a matter of waiting. I can also see how the whole family was together on Wednesday night. We were all in her room. Mm -hmm. And we all left bar one of my siblings who stayed. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. And another one of my siblings came back at 5.30 in the morning and she passed at 6.30. Mm-hmm. I can also see how her, um, not in that moment deciding, but perhaps the weeks and months leading up to it deciding, that all of us being together in that moment could have been completely valid for a hastening the mm-hmm. end of life as well. Mm-hmm. So I literally am. I'm glad she didn't because we got this amazing time. But I could see how, mm-hmm. not weeks or months, but hours out, yeah. You, you, yeah. It doesn't seem to be the most abhorrent thing to me. Yeah. I'm not saying that I'm on board because I really still am. It's too fresh for me, but I can understand both both perspectives. Yeah. yeah. No, and it's I I get it. I do. I think I understand both perspectives to a certain degree. I mean, you know, obviously I have my opinion, but um to what you were saying mm. is that I've talked with families, um families who have wondered about euthanasia about hastening the death of of their loved one who've been in the hospice and it can go on for days you know with somebody who's just had a big stroke or somebody who's had you know something happen and and the the death vigil Mm. and it can be both the most amazing and mystical experience and and in a way like birth because of that that transformation Mm. and that transition and it can be awful. I mean, you're watching somebody who is having big pauses in their breath, and is this uh, is this the last one? Yep. And everybody's gathered, and and you know, extremely anxiety provoking, and and very personal. Mm. And then when death happens, it always seems so sudden. No matter, it's it's amazing how many people will say, "Wow, you know, that was sudden," mm. even if they've been sitting at the bedside for ten days. Um, but anyways, I've talked with I've talked with families who've who've said why can't we hasten this and what what's the purpose? And I have given that a lot of thought and I do think that for some families that the purpose is to get them ready. Yeah. That I can see that totally. Yep, yeah, that I've had families who've come in and the the say the father has chosen to not have any further curative attempts mm-hmm. at, at at treatment and their children are mad. Their children are like, oh, dad's given up and, and why is he here? And they're, they're angry and they're upset. And then as they go through a process of a couple or three, four days, they're ready. They're ready for dad to die. Mm. And they know that this is, this is dad's time and that this was a natural process that occurred and that there aren't, there's no other way that, that, you know, we all die and that we're all going to have an end of life mm. and that, that their dad is at this point. And they're actually eager for it to be that moment because they've been waiting. And so I think that that gives them in, in, that, in that bereavement, in the grief that comes for the rest of that, you know, the life afterwards, is that we were ready. Dad was ready. We were all ready for that moment. Mm. Now, not every family has that, but I think that there's a lot of families who do. And not even every family, but not every person within every family. That's great. That's why I've said very clearly, I don't want to speak on behalf of my siblings. Yeah. I went through my experience, and in the same room, there were seven different experiences. Yes. You know, I just, I don't know. But yeah. I'm, I'm interested, this is going to feel like a bit of a massive right-hand turn <laughs> for a second. Okay. Um, and it might be completely out of the park, left field, not, not, not appropriate, but not the right thing, but... Because you've been talking a little bit about your specialty area mm. with uh, with children, mm-hmm. is there any link between how people feel about euthanasia and how people think about abortion? I mean, if you played these same rules, rules, opinions about autonomy, about um, someone having you know the right to be in complete control mm-hmm. and not and, and a family not being involved, for some reason when you were talking about children, I know you weren't talking about prenatal, mm-hmm. but I thought. If you added all those things to things like the father mm-hmm. of the baby mm-hmm. and the autonomy, you know these sorts right. of things, I just it just made me think: is there uh, uh, is there any is there any connection? Like, is there is it hypocritical to say I am anti euthanasia but pro abortion or something like that? Yeah. Um, 
Well, certainly for the people when we talked about when I talked about sanctity of life, mm. I think that um, for quite a lot of people who have those uh, the religious value that uh, particularly that God gives life, and that when humans get in the way of that, that mm. they're they're doing something wrong. And I I think that you know the some of the Catholic and Christian theologies that they're very linked that euthanasia and abortion are very linked. I don't think that they're linked for everybody. I think that um, with the as a bioethicist, mm-hmm. what let's, they, let's say I'm a student and I brought up this question in one of your classes. Yeah. I am. I am. I'm not. But let's say I'm a. I'm a woman mm-hmm. who wants to own my body. Mm-hmm. I'm. I'm pro-choice, mm-hmm. and but I am anti-abortion. How would one address that? No, I'm pro-choice, <laughs> and I'm. Pro, and I'm and sorry. anti-euthanasia. Yeah. 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 Um, I think some of the same same things that we've been been talking about as far as um, the issues of coercion and capacity and um, do you when you talk you know it, it's a big thing talking about totally. euthanasia you know as a as a what are the circumstances and are sorry, you talking I, I, I about, about it ten times as big yeah yeah in, old people or people with like your mom with motor neuron disease or you know when you get to the extremes you're talking about young people with um mental illness yep you know that that seymour's bill also allows for that which is one of the things where i i also disagree with it is is that it the criteria not that you have a terminal illness mm. it's that you have a terminal illness or you have uh, irremediable suffering that is not able to be relieved by any method acceptable to the person so if somebody has schizophrenia mm-hmm. and they don't like the side effects of their medications under this bill that would be su- you could you could argue that that's suffering and that they should be able to kill themselves mm-hmm. to to have euthanasia um and so that's you know you get into these hairy really hairy situations i mean because it's such a i'm making you know b- these gestures for these really broad mm. um the broadness of of what could be encompassed and and where the the lines are mm-hmm. um so there's there's situations that are probably a little bit more straightforward mm. and you know where there's more certainty um like you just talked about that you said with your mom and with some people who are very very old you know that yeah. the certainty that death is near yeah. and then there are times where there is um a lot more gray as far as diagnosis and what their mental state is um Again, look, we, we've, I, I know that I probably yep. asked a question that would, might be unanswerable, but again, it just made me think, and this is not coming from someone who is, mm-hmm. I, I, just so you know, mm-hmm. when people ask me if I'm pro-choice mm-hmm. or pro-life, I say I'm neither, because they're both political campaigns these days. Mm-hmm. I say I'm pro-people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So my position is I'm yep. pro-people. Yep. But it's interesting that you just said something else as well, that this one of the reasons we're, you're against this bill, or you have a submission against this bill, mm. is because it can include... Um, mentally handicapped people you know a lot of people will then also say that if you've got a an unborn baby with down syndrome etc 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 that's a fair enough reason to abort them mm-hmm. is that a hypocrisy i won't even ask you because i know it's difficult but within society is that a hypocrisy that we're going to say you can't put this down syndrome person who's 35 to, to death to put them to death allow them to euthanize mm-hmm. but you can do this one that's at 14 weeks right well it's Again, you can't. You, you, you want that you want the whole family involved in this decision, right? But in this decision, it's down to one person, and they can make that decision. You know, how, I it's, mean, well, I guess there's two things here. One is is that what's the moral status of the fetus, mm-hmm. and even in like the principle of double effect that we talked about earlier, where your intent is to do good, and by doing good, you do you end up as a side effect having harm. Yeah. Certain kinds of abortion do fall in that, where the mother's life is at stake, and it's a good to save mother's life. Yep. And that the the fetus um, it, it dies because the the mother's life was saved. Mm-hmm. So you you know you get to again there's there's a whole bunch of gray areas. There's there's abortion at, at early before you before um, you know it even looks like you know I mean you could say you know there's an argument for conception. That's yeah. and. Um, 
I kind of, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to come out and say I have a problem with that argument that, um, that, just to just to find which exact argument the, that that human life yep. begins at conception okay. and that the a conceptus, uh, an embryo has yep. moral status. Right. Yep. Right. So so that therefore means if a pregnant mother is killed, that's the death of one person, not the death of two. They don't have they don't aren't seen as a human. Yeah. Well, yeah. or if you've you've created an embryo in yeah. a petri dish and you're going to do in vitro fertilization, there'll be people who argue that that embryo has status as a human being. Even in the petri dish. Yeah. Even in the petri really? dish. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so somewhere in between the embryo in the petri dish and a term baby, mm. that there is a place where we offer protections to to that. Where uh, should that place be? Do you think? <laughs> look, I, I, th- I, I know this is. I know this is. This is what we do in the department yeah. of conversation. We yeah. go all yeah, over yeah, the place, yeah. and I think that this is really interesting because I, I have you kind of had this sort of conversation in LinkedIn before. I wonder if it's a. You know, unique. one of one of the rules in America is that you don't talk about abortion. Well, <laughs> in, in, in this in this building on this podcast, we talk about abortion and we talk about politics and we talk about sex and we talk about everything. Yeah, but yep. I, it's just yeah. I, I just. I guess what I do sometimes is I hear a rationale for something mm-hmm. and then I go, but what if we apply that rationale to there? Mm-hmm. And I go, how does that fit? Now, it right. might be that they're not connected at all. So, for example, in America, you know, the, the evangelical right are very pro-life, mm-hmm. but then they support the death penalty. I go, mm-hmm. well, hang on, how do you apply that principle there? Right. So I'm kind of, it's, it's just it's something I do. And yeah. I'm sorry if yeah, it makes no, it difficult, no. but I, mean, I, I think as someone who is a bioethicist, it's an interesting take to go, you know, let's, Let's apply those principles to it. Mm-hmm. Look, because I believe that once there is cells dividing, there is life. Mm-hmm. I don't know whether I'd call that a baby or a fetus or whatever, but cells are life. Mm-hmm. So using terms, uh, terms like hastening the end of life, mm-hmm. I think it's fair to say that an abortion is ending life. It might not be killing a baby. It might not be mm-hmm. killing a fetus, but it's certainly terminating life. Not Sorry, did I say a life? I'm just using the word life. Yeah. Does tissue have life? Like if I take out your tonsil and it was alive when it was in you and I took it out? Does tissue have life? I don't know. Yeah, it's dividing and it's, you know, having nutrients and metabolizing. Yeah, yeah, no, fair question. So that's, you know, that's why I'm I'm pretty comfortable with stating that the embryo um, does not have moral status, but as far as I'm as far as I'm concerned. Now, okay. where where the fetus, where, where the embryo becomes a fetus and where that fetus is, I'm not willing to, to make a stand, <laughs> any kind of a stand about about when that occurs. But I, you know, I will say that, that there's somewhere in between implantation yeah. in the uterus and the birth of a child that... So whilst it's still in the womb at some stage, it would get status. That it gets some status, that it deserves some protection. Maybe that, when it's viable at 24 weeks or I don't know. something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, um, but oh. yeah, there and it's rough issues. It's it's, uh, you know, what you were just saying is when people argue the extremes, it gets really hard. I yeah. I went to a bioethics conference um, just a few weeks ago, and they were talking. Actually, they were talking about the extremes of when you go to protect a future child, and oh, okay. what they said was that. So they talk about future child as a in the womb. That's what this they mean is, by this future is, child. This is yeah, future child. This is assuming. They, they didn't want to, again, talk about the moral status of the fetus, but they were going to assume for this argument that this child was was going to be born, that this was a, a, a pregnancy that was going to be carried to term, yeah. and that there would be a resulting child from it. And they were talking about fetal alcohol syndrome. Right. And they were saying, where do does society have any role in protecting uh, this future child who could be terribly, their, li- their whole life could mm-hmm. be affected by having fetal alcohol syndrome. But then when you get, so the first steps were things like trying to educate moms and trying to educate communities and helping people support moms, pregnant moms. So, so fence at the top of the cliff, stop the kid having fetal alcohol syndrome. Yeah, That's yeah. the first thing. But well, the, the whole thing is about stopping that. Yeah. But what you go to is when you start taking an argument to its extreme, it goes from, that seems very sensible. Let's argue, let's, let's support moms in, in not drinking while they're pregnant mm. to to the doesn't seem very sensible side which would be to imprison pregnant moms who are drinking who who are alcoholics and and wouldn't or couldn't stop um to force them to be dry to force them to be dry and oh, to lose wow. their liberty over that and that's you know, actually 
Let's, are we talking about a theoretical debate? We're talking here, a or theoretical is this debate. Okay. Yeah, this is a theoretical debate, and the but the um, what my point is is when you push anything to the extremes, mm. um, that you get into territory that that you're like, holy cow, you know. In one sense, it's nice to to take an argument all the way to its end and see where you would get. Yeah. But in other ways, sometimes you get to places that totally don't make sense. Yeah, like yeah. the the last argument with that one was is that they could um, that a, a mom who was was drinking heavily could be forced to have an abortion so that she wouldn't bear a child with fetal alcohol syndrome. Right. And I don't think anybody's gonna say that that's right. But the that was the when you take this argument that started with, well, let's just, you know, educate the community to support moms in not drinking when they're pregnant, all the way to this this extreme. So it's it's in society we would call that something like the slippery slope mm. kind of argument, and mm. that's often one of the things that's said back now to the yeah, euthanasia thing. Yeah, about euthanasia, yeah. Is is the slippery slope? You know, yeah. once we introduce it, and it actually sounds like. David Seymour's bill isn't particularly well written or mm. or thought through because mm-hmm. in my book I was thinking well if it says you know in the last 36 hours of a life and with consent from someone with psychological mm-hmm. kind of confirmation that they were mm-hmm. of sound mind a month before you know these sorts of yeah sp- then then maybe it would be acceptable by society what you've described doesn't sound it no. but one of, often one of the arguments is well next there'll be knocking off 15 year olds with depression the slippery mm-hmm. slope argument mm-hmm. but there are some countries that i understand and i'm thinking about holland or parts mm-hmm. of scandinavia mm-hmm. where th- that you do hear stories occasionally of you know the 15 year old with ms that mm-hmm. is being allowed to euthanize yeah uh, uh, again urban myth or is that actually happening? um i don't know how much it's happening i do know that they legalized it about four years ago because yeah. uh it was about the time i transitioned uh to New Zealand, maybe right. a little bit before, probably five years ago now that they that they legalized uh, uh, minors could have euthanasia in um, Belgium. Is it Belgium? Is it okay? My apologies. Belgium or the Dutch. Belgium or Holland? Yeah, it might be Holland. So yeah, we'll yeah, try. yeah. It's probably Holland. So, um, what time we got? What are we doing? Mm, looks like it's ten after five. Oh wow, we've been cruising. All right, <laughs> we'll start to wrap this mother up. Um, are there any other than Oregon? Mm-hmm. You seem to think that Oregon has an, a system that might work. Yeah. Other than Oregon, are there any countries or places where you've seen or researched euthanasia being used that you think maybe they've got the right balance? Not yet. No. Um, that's why I brought up Oregon. Is is mm. in the in the examples. Um, so there's there's going to be a new law in Victoria, but that hasn't been um, Victoria, Australia. Yeah, right. That hasn't come into into action yet. They're going to figure out implementation. Mm-hmm. It's recently uh, two and a half years now in Canada, um, but that bill uh, or that law, I I, I think is not uh, as smooth and it has some some problems. Mm-hmm. Um, can't. Uh, California has passed one, right? Um, which has been it's been held up a couple of times, but I don't think it's been in long enough for them to have done their research. Washington and Vermont are, are and I don't know much about those, and they're, you know, Oregon is sort of the model because they've actually not only had the law but done the research on it. Well, the so other, it's the too other, early to say for some of the other ones. The other thing about that graph that Jace brought yeah. up earlier. I mean, it's horrible to talk about people like numbers, but 250 people in a year. Yeah. I'm not sure of the population of Oregon, but that doesn't seem like a huge number no. going to that that end. Can you pull up Canada? In what way? The numbers for Canada for euthanasia over the last couple of years? So Cause there we'll are Google numbers of euthanized yeah. people in yeah, Canada. Yeah, yeah. Because it's, uh, it's quite large. I'm, I've, I've been told that um, the... For for per capita, mm-hmm. that the rate has been quite high, whereas Oregon it never has been. So this is uh, an article that says number of Canadians choosing medically assisted death jumps by thirty percent. Uh, there were one thousand five hundred and twenty three medically assisted deaths in Canada in the last six months, reporting period a nearly thirty percent increase over the previous six months. We got a date on that. Do we know when that when that's from? I didn't see one. Uh, so it's 21st of June this year. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, there it is. So, what, that's 3,000 a year? 
Yeah, well, it just, I mean, this is just, they've just started. Um, 2015, yeah, 2015 oh. is when they... Um, and are you, I mean, obviously you'll have done the research on, on what their criteria is. Are you unhappy mm. with what the Canadian, like if you were putting a submission to the mm -hmm. Canadians, would mm -hmm. you have been yeah, against they used, that as well? Actually, the, um, the uh, suffering, uh, irremediable suffering clause, I think that uh, uh, David Seymour et al. took that from the Canadians, right. which hadn't been used before the Canadians. Um, there, there are some people scratching their heads and saying, where did this, this term come from and what does it mean and do we have a definition? And, you know, like, if you're just using irremediable suffering, I call that the human condition. Well, the other thing about <laughs> irremediable suffering is I've got arthritis in my lower right. spine and my I'm in constant pain. Right. Is that enough? Yes. Cripes. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the Canadian, um, the Canadian law, what the initial case was, that it came to the Supreme Court in Canada, but it was somebody who had a spinal cord stenosis kind of a, a, a problem of chronic pain mm. um so yeah i i think that that's extremely broad because i think that um irremediable suffering with a decline that describes aging yeah. you know <laughs> we're all gonna have yeah we're all gonna have times and things that we suffer and we're all gonna have an irremediable you know a decline yeah. Last question, mm. maybe. We'll see where it yeah. goes. We might bring up some other thing. Talk about religion next. That'll get us going for another hour. <laughs> um, if you were given the bill mm. by David Seymour, mm. he says, you seem to be a bit of a smarty pants on all this. Mm -hmm. Fix it for me. I did. And what what would you suggest? And what? I, how would you change it to then yeah, be able to support Actually, it? that's what I did in my okay. submission. Tell us. Um, oh, gosh. Now I have to, to remember all of it. But... I, I thought that you needed two at least two physicians and preferably another person involved. There was it was really fell to just one um, one physician to do the capacity, the determination of prognostication, whether they had a terminal disorder, mm -hmm. um, to determine the co capacity coercion and terminality. That was all done by one doctor. They didn't have to tell anybody else. Only only if this there was questionable about their capacity then it would um, go on so I think that you would need at least somebody who knew the patient there's no requirement to know the patient there's no requirement right. that that doctor be a specialist in the area of the disease the patient has there's not even a requirement that they be a senior doctor they could be a junior doctor their first year out of one of your students one of my <laughs> students in a few years yeah <laughs> So I think that they've got a lot of cleaning up to do right. to do there. Um, I've already told you about the families and disclosures. Oregon, they have to have two um, family or friends that go to the informed consent process mm -hmm. and that sign that they were there and that the person wanted it. And I think that something like that's a really good idea. Um, Oh, there's there, the, there's a whole thing about the doctor has to stay in the room or very nearby during the process of death, and I think that that's a recipe for disaster for the for the doctors. Why is that? Because I don't think it's easy to watch somebody die, and it's even worse if you're the one who hastened death. Right. I mean, I I haven't done it, but when I imagine what that's like, right. I mean, you just had this experience when some when the when the person leaves their body. Mm. That's a big deal. Mm. And to have been a part of hastening that, I think that that, um, and weighs, to have to weighs watch. Hev weighs yeah, heavily. to have to watch it. I imagine if there was a hundred a week of those. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, so far the reports coming from Canada um, are the people who've, the, the law is the same, the, the same in Canada that they have to, they have to stay until the person dies from the beginning to the end of the procedure. Mm. And that does a couple of things. It makes them, more likely to use the intravenous route um, because it's um, <laughs> they don't have to wait as long. You know, right. the doctors don't have to spend the whole day at the bedside right. waiting for the death to occur. Um, and uh, and it puts I think it puts a huge moral burden on the doctor that, uh, you, you know, you might break your doctors. Um, right. And that you know that's not good for anybody. Again, yeah. that's a lose lose situation. Do you think, at some stage, in some way, is your opinion that this will pass? Maybe not in its current form, mm -hmm. but 
following Oregon, following Canada, following whatever's happening in Victoria? Will that eventually be a part of our society? You know, I, I think, and I think that's one of the reasons why I am taking the opinion that the the, the tact that I am mm-hmm. is that yeah, I do. I think that the majority of New Zealanders support it. I do think that it is the um, that that our society is trending. Western society is trending towards more countries legalizing some form mm-hmm. of euthanasia. I think that to take baby steps into that pool is a really good idea. I think that that trying to anticipate and mitigate mistakes and harm is one of the most important things that, um, again, if we, we, we weigh the person's autonomy versus the possible harms that it can cause to society yep. and what happens when things go wrong, um, that we, we need to we need to take very little steps. Um, and yeah, so that's why I, I think I think that it's going to um, be with us. This isn't the first bill that's been introduced mm-hmm. in New Zealand. And as, as we just talked about, other countries and other states in the U.S. and Europe are also going this way. So what what can we do if if people are looking for the the um, comfort and the security of knowing that they have some control over their end of life and that if things get too terrible that they have some options of of controlling their own timing mm-hmm. of death um, that we should do it in a way to mitigate harm the most. And I reflect back to one of the statements you made earlier, which I love, is um, doing something for a patient rather than to a patient. Mm. I think that's a lovely way to think about mm. maybe just the whole medical process, not just mm-hmm. this conversation. Yeah. Now, if people want to see your submission, yep. are they able to? Have we got a link that we could put on the YouTube page or something? You know what? We should take a look for that because I believe that they were all public. Okay. And I did. I put in um, very specific things. Like I said, I, I'd been in the Model United Nations in high school, <laughs> and so I had... Um, made legislation um, before, and so I did. I was very specific in my in my suggestions to change it from a uh, a, a, f- a euthanasia bill to an assisted suicide bill, and right. then quite a lot of changes as far as the um, the process of of um, having safeguards. Okay. The safeguards. Maybe well. you can fire us a copy of the submission or a link yeah, to it, yeah. and we'll put it on the Facebook page okay. if people want to read it. Sure. Anything else you want to leave us with? Wow, well, we've just been, we've been pretty writing? thorough. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. <laughs> I'm, I'm very sorry if I brought up anything that took us <laughs> on a path that Americans don't normally talk about, but <laughs> sort of what we do here. <laughs> That's right. Um, it was amazing. Thank you. Yeah. And it was particularly pertinent for me, obviously. Yeah, yeah. So, um, Dr. Well, Janine Winters, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. For being a part of the Department of Conversation. Thanks. All right.